Welcome to another episode of Up To. Nine years ago, Up To started as a live event series showcasing leaders who are as humble as they are successful. The humility piece is extremely important as we identify leaders who can inspire others. We try to focus our interviews on the non-business aspects of their lives. And in doing so, we have found there's a real thirst to explore their hearts and minds in atypical ways. Our host, as always, is Adam Kaufman. And on this episode, we are joined by Peter Goldstone. If you're a business owner, an executive, or a rising member of a management team, I don't have to tell you about the importance of having team members and partners you can trust. A firm that I've worked with for years and have trusted myself to refer my colleagues to is Vividfront, an award-winning digital marketing, branding, and website development firm based in Cleveland, Ohio, but with clients all over America. Vividfront's focus is on scaling brands digitally. They create holistic, return-on-investment-centric strategies and solutions for middle market companies who want to grow. They do paid advertising, influencer and social media marketing, e-commerce strategies, lead generation websites, I could go on. Their expertise is expansive and their tactful leadership team, all of whom I know, has the entrepreneurial experience to turn ideas into revenue producing business plans. Yes, I am reading a script, but I will tell you that I sought Vividfront out for this podcast because I already believed in them seeing what they did in the marketplace. So if you're seeking a partner to take your business to the next level, or if you're looking for an opportunity to work for a top agency with an amazing culture, truly an amazing culture, check out their website at vividfront.com or send me a note and I'll introduce you to my friends who run the company there. Vividfront, great organization. Our guest today is a business leader who has accomplished a ton of professional success, seemingly always with a huge smile on his face. Over a period of several years, I've observed his passion for team building, for creating a tremendous culture in his businesses, and what Jim Collins calls level five leadership. I don't know if you've ever been called that before. But a level five leader successfully demonstrates both personal humility and indomitable will. That describes our guest today. This dynamic leader did not make it to where he is without needing to deal with some significant curves in the road along the way. We'll delve into that for sure. He's an expert in digital media, in data analytics, in publishing, and in making me laugh. (laughs) Currently the chairman of the Government Executive Media Group and formerly the CEO of Hanley Wood, one of the 10 largest B2B media companies in the United States. Our guest today orchestrated the successful sale of Hanley Wood a few years ago, having grown that company to more than 80 publications and digital media assets in the construction and building materials industries. On a personal note, I watched our guest take his time before jumping into his next big project after enjoying this rare and maybe once in a lifetime liquidity event. Unlike so many entrepreneurs and leaders who make hasty decisions and rush into their next gig, today's guest was rather methodical, and I was proud of him for that, about reflecting on what he wanted his life to look like before making professional or civic commitments too quickly. He's done that, and now I see our guest thriving in not only business terms, but in terms of living his life to the fullest and becoming what we all seek, the best version of himself. He lights up when he talks about his family, and I've always admired his joie de vie. Peter Goldstone, welcome to Up To. That's great to be here, Adam. So good to see you, my friend. What have you been up to? Uh, Been up to a lot. It's, um, as you know, it's been wild and woolly a couple of years for everybody. So I've gotten to know myself a lot, been spending a lot of time alone, as my girlfriend works all the time, I Mm -hmm. really see her, and uh, of course we're not back to the office yet, so... There's that. So that's been very reflective and very powerful. What have those reflections uh, suggested? Maybe you said you got to know yourself better. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's, um, you know, when you're when you work in a career as long as I have and you're working with lots of people, teams of people, it becomes a community. You're deeply immersed in working with lots of people in lots of different community settings. And all of a sudden you you sell your company I got divorced recently a few years ago, 
met a wonderful woman who works all the time, which is great. Love mm-hmm. to support that. But you spend a lot of time alone. These so it days. went from like massive stimuli from lots of different directions to unbelievable. Like the the spigot just turned off immediately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know, as you suggested earlier, you know, I had to really take some time to think about how I wanted to live my days, right? And uh, when I sold my company, did I want to jump right back into a big job opportunity as potentially leader, CEO of another big company and deal with that 24-7? Or did I want to really just take time, mm-hmm. reflect, do a portfolio of different things, including what I'm involved in today, which is chairman of government executive, which is a great high growth company. Yeah, we'll talk about that. But I, I did love how you fought the temptations to, you had some opportunities. I remember some overtures were made to you, do this or do that. And we talked about how to make decisions. We have to manage our pride. Oh, it'd be cool to run a big thing or our emotions. I'm bored. That's kind of an emotion. So how did, how did you, before we even decide what you did next, how did you deal with that decision-making process? Yeah, it was very interesting. So I'm um, just very lucky to have lots of great people in my life that I can lean on. And, um, you know, I've had many mentors throughout my life and my career and my family has been mm-hmm. incredibly important. People like you have been important. Uh, my professional mm-hmm. organizations like Path North, you know, met wonderful people through that experience. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the past, I might have made every decision on my own, been fearful to show my vulnerability, mm-hmm. fearful to really understand what I wanted and what would potentially be best for me as opposed to just gravitating towards the easiest decision it would have been very easy for me to go with another private equity sponsor, run another big media information company because mm-hmm. I've done that for 30 years. You know that at the back of your hand. Correct. But I know in my heart of hearts that that necessarily wasn't going to make me the happiest person. I know you love tennis, for instance, and yeah. you know that... Uh, is a whole different kind of industry, if that's the right word. You could have gone in that direction, or you could have gone in a philanthropic direction. Um, Before we get too far um, ahead, what is the government media group? So folks can understand, like, what you do now. Right. So government executive is is a, was an arm of the Atlantic Media Company. And it was the B2B or B2G information So the Atlantic, stream. the magazine we all know as consumers. Correct. Okay. And they had a B2B, business-to-business, or business-to-government information platform called Government Ex- Executive. So if you work in government, federal, state, and local, defense, you're probably getting our brands, which are media and information brands, which inform you about how to stay on your mission and how to support your mission in Mm. government. Mm. So it's a media entity which provides really useful information, must have information for decision support for government executives. So it reminds me a little bit, Hanley Wood communicated different industry through many different, I think it was 80 assets. So it's kind of like black labeling publications Correct. So Similarly again. Right. So a, spe- a specified business sector will receive specialized information about how to do their work better. Hmm. How to, and in government, it's, it's so mission-based yeah. that the information really aligns to the mission that government executives have day to day. Okay. So it's a very specialized B2B information play. So you took this time that I'm commending you for taking, and then you decided to move into this government communications mini conglomerate and what attracted you to it why why did you say yes to that as opposed to some other things yeah it's very interesting so i teamed up with um new private equity fund that focused on smaller high growth emerging companies most private equity funds focus on middle market or big companies because they have to put a lot of capital to work right the thesis here was these these friends of mine created a smaller fund to focus on really small, high-growth emerging companies with a technology, tech stack type of infrastructure, which allows them to 
you know, to play in high growth areas of technology. And during your year of thinking about it, this is something that you thought you wanted to get into a smaller maybe enterprise. I did. And I also realized that I didn't want to be the CEO. So um, ha- having the opportunity to be chairman mm. and work part time and mentor and support young talent okay. has been incredibly rewarding. Oh, that's so. interesting. Cause that- is similar to maybe when you were building a team at Hanley Wood. Correct. You're not managing them day to day, but you're mentoring, you're attracting talent, and you're coaching them to become you know better in their particular roles. Correct. So, um, so the folks at Government Executive, for instance, you know, were part of a bigger company, the Atlantic Media Company. They had never done acquisitions. They had never had tremendous investment capital available to them. So, you know, they have they had to learn how to grow really quickly, and and that's really fun, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so pulling them out of the Atlantic and putting all the focus on this one platform where they get all the love, right, and all the capital. Um, is an incredibly rewarding thing. So Mm -hmm. you take folks that really want to grow and you give them the capital and the environment to grow in and it's been tremendously rewarding. What a great role for you. Do you also get involved in raising capital for the next round of acquisitions or is that other people? We do. So so we we work with the sponsors, Growth Catalyst Partners, and they do all the fundraising themselves, but all the executive sponsors of which I am one play into, you know, thinking through the strategy for growth for the next fund. Got it. Right. So you're the chairman now. Prior to that, you were the CEO of Hanley Wood. Correct. Prior to that, you were the president below the CEO of Hanley Wood. Yes. Right? Yes. So it, you're smiling. Is it pretty cool being chairman? Uh, it's great being chairman. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing because um, what I loved about my career is it was such a creative outlet. And having the opportunity to participate in building strategy and creating these great companies and serving incredibly important markets like government, right. particularly in this day and age, yes. when government is activated and so important and so robust in supporting what's going on in the world right now. Um, it's just an amazing creative outlet for me. So to work with people build teams, create new business models, transform old guard legacy media business into new age information businesses Mm -hmm. is great. And not having all the minute by minute stress and responsibility of being the CEO. Right. So it's been tremendously liberating, right? When you were CEO at the height of Hanley Woods robustness, how many employees Indirectly, direct report. We had roughly 600 employees. Yeah, so that's a lot going on. At the end of the day, the buck stops here with you. Correct. That's right. Uh, Yeah, so putting out fires every day. You know, really, we try not to, but we're really only looking at what's right in front of us and what just happened. So it's a little different as chairman, I guess. That's right. So at Hanley Wood, there was, you know, there were three rounds of private equity ownership. And I was president of the company for two and CEO for one. Got it. And not all chapters are created equal right Right. you deal with well that's i think we call that life that's life you deal with growth opportunities growth chapters you you deal with recessionary chapters do with problems unexpectedly at hanley wood which focus on the housing and construction market so you had you know the big short chapter happen so we were you in that movie (laughs) <laughs> it should have been. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, Good movie. So we rode the company up, and then we suffered the bubble bursting. And, yep. you know, there's just a lot that goes on when you deal with, you know, very cyclical markets. Right. Right. Well, speaking of suffering, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I've had some curves in the road in my own life, and I've had to deal with unexpected scenarios. Uh, were there any curves in the road for you during your Hanley Wood tenure? Yeah, there were so many. As you know, uh, we've described them. There was, there was. You yeah. worked with your best friend there, right? He was CEO. Correct. So I came down from New York, uh, where I'm from, where I worked in the media world, and got recruited to become president of the Handywood Media Platform. You don't have a New York accent. That's I, I kind don't. of forget sometimes. You're from New York. That's correct. You're so Washingtonian, and that, you don't have an accent. That's right. <laughs> worked hard. Yeah. Oh yeah, but you still have a. You spend some summertime in New York. I certainly right. do. I certainly right. do. And my heart and my sports allegiances are all New York. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry for that. 
So Hanleywood, I was with Hanleywood for 20 years, and it was the fastest growing top 10 B2B media companies in the country mm-hmm. with brilliant leadership above me, mentors of mine, and great talent in an incredibly robust and important market, the housing and construction market. Um, as you know, the market went way up, and then the market went way down when the bubble burst. My best friend um, was the CEO of the company, and when the bubble burst, um, the company was suffering, obviously, because the market had declined 80%. It wasn't just your company. It was the industry. It was, it was the, the industry. economy. Yeah, the in industry America. declined 80%. Our company led the market. We only declined 50%. But at the end of the day, all the equity got wiped out. Mm-hmm. And my friend, unfortunately, my best friend, and we're still very good friends, had to let me go. Mm. And that was in 2011 wow. uh, when the bubble burst. And so, you know, that was a first time in my life I had been let go. It was tremendously... And it was someone you were close with. Really close and shocked to my system. And it, obviously, it wasn't his call. You know, right. it's the private equity firm's call. And he totally regretted, and he did it respectfully and gracefully. Did but you see that moment coming, or was I, it like, well, let's go to lunch one day? Or? I really didn't. I really didn't. I should have, but I didn't. Mm. And maybe it's because of my eternal optimism um, that I never thought that would happen. So mm. it was a shock, as you can imagine. And, you know, I had this glorious career, and all of a sudden, you know, you get mm. brought down to earth with Do you mind reality. Me asking, how old were you then? I'm trying to get a snapshot of, like, what phase of life you were in for that. So I'll be turning 65, and it happened in 2011, roughly 11 years ago. So okay. I was 54. So your world got rocked. Got rocked. 11 years ago. And, and one of our uh, podcast guests, uh, Dale Jones, he was on, and he said something about... Um, he learned, don't get too wrapped up in what you do, because when it, it gets taken away from you, then who are you? And I thought that was pretty interesting, because a lot of us men, especially in work, we're, we're identified with our work life. Correct. And he was saying, don't be too wrapped up. He was kind of like giving me advice, but rhetorical for everyone. Don't get too wrapped up in your identity being where you work. Right. Because if that goes away, a moment like this can really be... Um, debilitating. Uh, yeah, it's shocking. It's yeah. shocking. I'm not so sure I agree with that statement because I going. like I like to dive in the deep end okay. and, you know with whatever I do and I'm not saying don't get wrapped up and lose yourself in the job. We're allowed to have different views are. on the Up to podcast. Correct. Definitely. Don't lose who you are for professional purposes only. Yes. But I'm also, uh, you know, I think I'm also of the mindset if you're going to do it, you just jump in the deep end and you yeah. go for it. And, and, and Hanley would... Well, that was the strong will of yours that I mentioned in the opening. You're, with humility, you also have a strong will, which is that kind of goal-oriented. I think so. Yeah. I think so. It was also a community. You know, like Hanley Wood was family. Mm. So it wasn't just a job. So what happens when you're told to leave the family? Yeah, how does that? Very I mean, how do you deal? How does your heart? How does your mind deal? Like get up the next day? Your heart gets dark, and yeah. uh, and there's a lot of resentment, and you have to get through the resentment, and you have to understand that this isn't anything that you did, and this isn't necessarily anything that anyone did to you. It's just circumstantial and environmental, and. And I get that now because I live through it. That and takes it, time, though. Like, I'd like to spend a moment on this because sure. a lot of people yeah. go through their curves in the road unexpectedly, whether it's marital or financial or health. So you said you have to get through it, realize you didn't create this. Like, how did you let go? Like, how were you listening to tapes? Were you going to some sort of spiritual activity? Were you talking to an, a mentor? Like, how did, how did you do that? Yeah, I just relied on the support system that I had. So people. Um, so don't be afraid to tell people. Tell people yeah. that you feel really badly mm-hmm. right now, that, that you're really struggling, that you're really sad, mm-hmm. and that you're really experiencing loss. Mm. And I don't think I was that great at it, you know, back then. 11 years ago, I don't think I was that... Great at showing my vulnerability. I would like pick myself up by my bootstraps and. Well, we're taught to be the strong yeah, male. Correct, correct. And I think that was the you know I've had a lot of loss in my life, which we can talk about. And, but losing that career identity, career definition, mm-hmm. you know, place to go every day, and and you know, purpose. 
purpose and um, was a lot of loss. Right. So do you think then, like if I could have talked to you one month into that period, do you think you would have predicted, yeah, I'll be in digital media again someday? Or did you think, I'm going to go back to teaching or tennis? Or- I, I really didn't know. You know, my kids were teenagers, so I had to keep working and plugging along because the college bill was coming up soon, right? And uh, there was a lot of financial pressure. Right, right. Um, so I had to get back in the game. Luckily, I had a pretty decent reputation, and a mm-hmm. lot of people came came calling. But mm-hmm. I didn't know that it was right. going to happen. You didn't and I didn't have the, the I hold. didn't have the confidence in myself enough to know that that was going to happen. But mm-hmm. it turned out to be, and we can talk about why. Right. The best thing that ever happened. To right. Me. Yeah. But in the moment, sometimes we don't know why this is happening. I call this God's kaleidoscope. And if you think about a kaleidoscope and there's a bunch of little dots, a series of dots, and one blue dot is just a blue dot. And that was the day that your best friend told you you couldn't work there anymore. Why is this happening to me? But then years later, you look back at the cylinder of the kaleidoscope and how all the pieces fit perfectly and make this beautiful system and that's your kaleidoscope now you have the benefit of time and some other decisions you made or god's will or free will whatever you want to call it fate some people call it and now it all makes sense to you you're about to say it was a great thing that happened to you yeah that's exactly right and i think that's a great way to characterize it it's um the kaleidoscope kaleidoscope of your journey right and what happens to you Mm -hmm. and all the data and inputs and right experiences you have makes you the man you are, mm-hmm. makes you the person you are over time. Mm-hmm. And so you fast forward and the story is like an episode out of Mad Men, which I'll share with you. So I went to the Atlantic and I became the president of... You look like Don Draper now that you say yeah, that, actually. different hairline. <laughs> <laughs> but everything else is the same. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I went to the Atlantic for one year and I became the president of the company that I now own, Government Media... Who would have ever thought? And that was like 10 years ago. And that was 10 years ago. And David Bradley generously hired me to run GovExec. And in that one year, I learned new skills. And I learned about a whole new operating model for media, from old guard traditional print media and events Mm -hmm. to digital media and this whole digital landscape that was emerging so quickly and disrupting and transforming the whole category. Skills you didn't have before. Skills I would not have had had I stayed at Hanley Wood. Yeah. So I was fortunate to be exposed to a whole new way of thinking about the media and information business. Quietly, and this is the Mad Men episode, behind the scenes, a private equity firm was buying the distressed debt of Hanley Wood and reached out to me and, and expressed to me that if they won the majority interest of the distressed debt, would I then come back with my new skills in digital media? You were better than when you left the company. Correct. Would you come back as CEO? Wow. And I said, well, I'd be honored to because, you know, I love Hanley Wood. It was my home for 20 years. So they... That must have been a surprising call to receive or email to it get. It was. It was. I never thought that that would happen and, and that my journey would lead me back to the place that I called my home for 20 years. Hmm. So the irony of it, of course, is I came back as CEO and had to tell my friend who let me go hmm. a few years earlier hmm. that I had to let him go. What as was CEO. that like for you? That was hard. It was hard. But. The was good, it was it an in person lunch or again the same questions I have like like how how do you even do that you look you look at your friend eye to eye and you say you know this isn't anything I had planned right and this isn't anything that you did probably wrong. similar things he was saying to you correct two I, plus years yeah. earlier and and it re- it's really just about empathy it's about learning how to be really. Empathetic. Yeah, the golden rule, do unto others. Right, in that situation. So the good news is that I came back as CEO, and my friend was kind of at the tail end of his career. He had been, he went, he took the company through the recession, which was really hard, and the restructuring. 
and he was kind of done mm. with operating the business. Okay. So he stayed on as a really advisor. valued advisor to me and helping me understand how to become a CEO. Mm. I had never been the CEO. I've always been the number two my whole career. And, um, and he was able to participate in the next run-up of the company, and he participated Good. both. So that chapter of that story ends right. well for him. Right. And then the final piece of the story was then when I sold Hanley Wood, I went back and bought government executive from the David firm Bible. that helped you ramp up your talents. Correct. Pre Hanley Wood. Right. So starting in Hanley Wood, went to GovExec at the Atlantic, went back to Hanley Wood, and then came back and bought GovExec. So this kaleidoscope, how everything comes full circle, I think that happens to a lot. So does that mean we're going to end up at a saloon in Iceland again, like I'm, we have been I'm in the past? Very, that's the only thing I'm working towards right now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> to see the northern lights. Oh, my days. gosh. Yeah, we were at the wrong time of year to do that, but it was a, quite a trip. I'm grateful that Calfee, Halter, and Griswold has once again agreed to partner with us. With offices in Ohio and Washington, D.C., this full-service national law firm focuses on all aspects of business and the law, including corporate and finance, intellectual property, and government relations. Let me be clear. I actually approach companies with whom I would like to partner. We just don't accept marketing dollars from anyone. I have been referring my CEO and entrepreneur friends to Calfee for years. I really believe in the firm. One of their notable practice areas is in mergers and acquisitions. And recently, for instance, I introduced a successful entrepreneur in the Midwest to Calfee when he told me that a European-based conglomerate wanted to buy his business. Calfee works with large corporations as well as privately held companies throughout the U.S. and Canada and in Europe and Asia, too. So whether it's selling your own business or the more routine needs of creating your first will or anything in between, this firm can really do it all in terms of legal needs. Once again, the firm is Calfee, Halter, and Griswold, and you can find them at C-A-L-F-E-E dot com or on the Up To Foundation website. I know you do like traveling, huh? switching gears for a minute, um, because we've, we've been fortunate to travel to some pretty interesting places together, hiking in Iceland and um, you know, a 12th century castle in France, and we can go on. Um, but what does travel do for you? That seems to somehow enliven you i know you go to like rock concerts in europe just for the weekend like what what does travel do for you so i I got this from my father and i lost my father last year my father was my best friend Mm -hmm. and my father um raised the two boys from a very young age i lost my mother when she was 47. Mm. so my dad played you know dad and mom and my dad always you know lived for the moment and one time i remember asking my dad uh you know how you doing this year, he goes, well, we had a great year. I go, what do you want to do? He goes, let's go to Italy. Huh. And the next year, I, I asked my dad, how you doing this year? He goes, we're flat broke. I go, what do you want to do? He goes, let's go to Italy. <laughs> okay, great. So I got this itch to see the world and experience the world from my father. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I pursued you know, travel and, and adventure travel um, as much as possible. So traveling for fun and then traveling to ski. Mm. Um, I do that as much as I can. The best thing I did right before COVID when we sold the company is I traveled for ru- you know roughly a year all over the world and uh, got that out of my system before COVID shutdown hit. So it was, it was a wonderful experience. Is there some place you're looking forward to getting back to now? With, I don't know if you were able to go skiing this winter or is there some place you're really looking forward to now as, as things open up? In addition to Cleveland, Ohio, I'm sure you're anxious to visit Can't wait to Cleveland. go to Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with right. you, Adam. That's right. right. That's right. right. But wh- where else is on your short list? I would have to say go back to Italy. You love Italy. Yeah, just because in my da- I lost my dad this past year mm. and had many great times in Italy with my father and others mm-hmm. and it would be just great to go back to Italy soon and uh- Drink some wine and right. see the cities. I know you and your father were very close. I remember one time when we were in Iceland together, we were sitting outside at a picnic table. I think it's, I don't know if it's called the Southern Coast or the Gold Coast. I can picture it. And it was like a great moment. It's like we were eating these langoustines and uh, it's like the warmest day of the year by chance. It was 65 right. in Iceland that day. And then you got a text or a phone call that uh, some challenging aspect of your dad's health had just occurred and 
I lost my father when I was 42, so I could relate to that note you were getting. Um, do you think the type of parent you are, I see how alive you are when you talk about your kids. Is it modeled after how your dad was, or is it a combination of different traits? No, it's 100% modeled after my father. He was a good father. He was a great father. He was so loving. He was so kind. He was so fun. He cared about his sons more than anything. And uh, we were best friends. I mean, mm. we went, went through many difficult things together. He lost his wife when she was 47. Mm -hmm. I was 18. He met his wife when he was 18 on a train to Vermont going to summer camp. Oh, so you previously no, actually, said... Actually, I'm sorry, when he was 13 going to summer camp. You previously said you lost your mother at 47. I thought you were 47, so you lost her when you were really young, Correct. when you were I a was, teenager. Yeah, she was 47, I was 18. So he raised us, and um, he, he showed me how to be a dad. Mm -hmm. He showed me how to be a parent, and... Uh, and I miss him every day. Right. Yeah. Well, I love seeing your um, Instagram posts about your actions with your kids and your experiences, whether it's with a dog or at the beach or at a wedding or something. So yeah. I can I can see the, uh, I don't mean to sound corny, but I can see the connection with your dad and you now playing out with you and your your kids, if that it, makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, and it's very, it's very, it's very rewarding, but it's also... Um, you know, I've, I've just I've experienced so much loss. My dad lost his wife. He also lost my younger brother, hmm. very young. So, and my dad just passed away. So, I'm the only one left from my nuclear family. You're the patriarch, so to speak. I'm the only one left. So it's uh, hmm. from my family. So right. these kids are pretty important to me. Right. Yeah. Do you think that uh, your kids, uh, I don't know, do they live close to you? Or I, one, Your son lived in China for a while. He did. My son's now back in D.C. Okay, good. So he's close, so we see, I see him pretty regularly. My right. daughter's up in Brooklyn in New York, and I okay. see her regularly because as a New Yorker, I have to, I have to get back to... So you, you guys spend a lot of time together. And well, another thing that I like about you is how, in spite of all your um, financial success... You stay pretty grounded, at least you seem to. Like, you've lived in the same house for many years. I'm sure you could have gotten some cool new place yeah. over time. Um, you know, you have, a, you have a fine car, but it's not like you're collecting sports cars like some of our mutual right. friends do. Right. Um, how are, is it, Maybe this is part of your dad's um, pedigree as well, but what, what, what keeps you grounded? Why, why are you so grounded? Yeah. It, it's, it, it sounds... Like, well, that's just who I am. But it's rare. I mean, look, the, the show is leaders as humble as they are successful because yeah. most aren't humble. So where do you think that comes from in you? It must be, must be my father and because uh, he, had, he had great successes and real struggles uh, career-wise. So he gained a lot. He lost a lot. Yeah, the struggles humble us. They do. So it could be fear. <laughs> right. A little bit. But I like to keep things simple. I mean, it's... Um, my father always quoted me this great quote from Runyer Kipling. Walk with kings, but don't lose your common touch. Walk with kings, but don't lose your common touch. Well, I'm sorry you're not walking with a king right now, but I I'm, think I'm I glad am. you're on the program. I but I, I, I like that phrase. I am. And, the, and the people that you've had on this program, I mean, I'm just incredibly humbled. I mean, ambassadors and people that work with Nelson Mandela uh -huh. and, you know, editors of L.A. Times. And, and now Peter Goldstone. And CEOs of billion-dollar companies. And mm. it's been a, it's, it's nice to be sitting here. You know, so much, th that's nice of you, so much of our identity is wrapped up in our work. I referenced that a little bit earlier, number of employees or sales volume or how many homes you have, etc. cetera. Um, I see though, you really aren't drawn to any of that. Um, yet, you know, we do like to go to Italy and that's okay. It's not a sin to, um, you know, celebrate, you know, the, the victory sometimes and smell the roses. What, what are you most uh, excited about in the future? Like, is something driving you, whether it's with this business or at home? Uh, like, is there another goal that you're moving towards? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't necessarily think in terms of future goals. Hmm. I really don't. That's I really it. just kind of live in the moment as huh. much as I possibly can. 
And I think it comes from the fact that, I think you know this about me, before I started my career in media and information, I was a school teacher. That was one of my questions. One time uh, we were walking down the street in old Geneva. Yeah. Geneva, Switzerland. That's right. We think we were looking for like a good pizza shop. And uh, you're like, oh, yeah, I used to live here. Yeah, I, I, I lived in Geneva. I taught soccer at some local school. I'm like, what on earth are you talking about? Like, exactly. You have these 25 different lives. I had no idea. Yeah. So before I got into um, the business world, and you talked about the forks in the road, mm-hmm. I was... I was um, a school teacher, and I was always training to be a school academic administrator and uh, or teacher. And I think I think what you were expressing earlier about my motivation yes. for working comes from the fact that I just loved teaching. Okay, and I loved being with people and this kind of lifelong learning of being with people and both teaching and learning from them is is my process, mm. is what I kind of wake up and think about all the time. And when it's happened throughout my career, I've had incredible mentors that I've learned from, yet I had to learn digital information and media from really young people of course. that I was managing right? because I didn't grow up with it. And That's what's cool about you is you're open to that. Some people yep. would have left Hanley Wood and decided, okay, great run, 20 years. I'm not going to learn some new skills, but yep. you, you did because yes. you're a constant learner. So I think in terms of the future, I just want to be stimulated and inspired creatively. Mm-hmm. And um, so the work, the portfolio work that I do now, not just with government executive, but being on boards of other media and information companies and my nonprofit work allows me to get a, a variety of experiences right. that I can learn from. And get Diverse stim- stimulation. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So that's been, that's always been kind of my my true north is to think about, you know, what inspires me what gets me excited. Yes. And the financial rewards are fantastic. But if you're inspired and you really care about what you're doing, then the financial rewards probably will come if you set yourself up in that situation. I often ask people on this program because I'm always interested in how achievers continue to learn. I always ask people, what are you reading and and how do you consume it? It's interesting asking you that question because you're like a creator of consumable news and content. So right, that's right. But still, I, I I still would love to know like, what do you read? How do you read it? Is it a favorite newsletter? Is it the Wall Street Journal? Like, how do you um, continue to learn? So I think you know, there's obviously an overabundance of media and information that's coming at you every single minute of the day with your phone online. Yes. So there's no shortage of Options. Options yeah. to learn. I about call the that world. like paralysis of options. Yeah. So the most amazing thing about it is there's you know, there's lots of bad information that gets a lot of press, media disinformation. This is why I ask this question. Yeah. So like what do sharp people I respect read or listen to? Because I have grown up in the media world, I've got an incredible amount of respect for people that run really responsible media and information outlets you had Shelby on the on the yeah on the show former and LA Times editor LA Times editor and what an incredible career he's had mm-hmm. so I trust these great media talents mm-hmm. to curate great information for me so you can get amazing information long form short form online right as it relates to just pleasure reading. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to make myself my my way through the New York Times Top 100 list of great books. Oh, wow. So I'm currently reading The Adventures of Augie March by Saul Bellow. And, you know, it's deep stuff. It's heavy. Right. But now I have the time to go through it. If I, have, if I don't understand a page, I got to reread it. I have the time to do that now. And that's a luxury. That so. would be a great, like, mental trophy in the mental it trophy is. case it of is. I read all hundred books. Yes, I'm probably through about twenty. Do you read them hard, tangible, or listen on audiobook? A little of both. Yeah. So I've just started Audible mm-hmm. because I have a new puppy and I'm on dog walks all the time and mm. so I'm listening as I walk, but I do read hardcover still. 
uh, this may seem predictable, but I love the podcast medium. Do you I do. listen to or watch? You know, what, What's your second favorite podcast after the Up To podcast? Of course, Up To, <laughs> way up there. Right, right. In right. a distant second. Yes. <laughs> you know, I listen to The Daily pretty often, New York Times. And, and does that always have the same host? Uh, or is it different journalists? There's different journalists that, okay. that come on. And that comes out daily? It comes out daily. All right, cool. And it's fantastic, deep, long format journalism about topics of the day. And that's one of the guilty pleasures. Yeah. And then the other guilty pleasure is a lot of podcasts about New York sports. Mm. A never ending dialogue of depression. <laughs> Currently. <laughs> right. That's right, in this right. Day. There's always next year. There's always I, hope. I live in Cleveland, Ohio, so we're very familiar with the phrase, there's always next That's year. That's right. Remember, we do have the Yankees, so there's 27 R- championships there. Right, right. right. Um, well, you know, we're here in, uh, right outside Washington, D.C. I know your um, wonderful girlfriend has a restaurant in Georgetown. What do you think about the return of cities? Not just like workplace, but just the cities. Yeah, it's very Post-COVID, interesting. Post-COVID. Um, post the you know kind of police strife issues, you know how how is your outlook on city life? Because I love cities. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100. percent I'm incredibly bullish on cities. Good. And I think cities will always be wonderfully vibrant. Okay. And the the interesting thing that's going on right now is the emergence not just of uh, major cities that we know of coming back albeit differently, because a lot of office buildings are still empty, but secondary cities, cities like Austin, cities like Nashville, cities like... um, I know you go to Charlotte sometimes. Santa Fe, Charlotte, Charleston. Right. So you've got this emergence of really vibrant, smaller cities that are offering employment, offering culture, offering food, lower cost of living. Right. Um, maybe a tech hub, you know, right. kind of thing. So right. cities are, you know, there's a big place in my heart for city living. And um, So you haven't given up hope on the return <laughs> of the vibrant city. I think, that, I think cities are just living organisms, and they always change, mm-hmm. and they always morph. And, you know, people ask the question, will New York City ever be the same after 9-11? Look what happened. That's true. Came roaring More vibrant than ever. That's right. So, you know, Hmm, the virus has had an impact on workplace living. And I think that is probably changed for a good long time. The demographic trends of young people. But that doesn't mean that cities are going away. Mm -hmm. It just means that cities are being... Let you know, utilize and experienced in different ways. And I think not just the same five cities get everything anymore. Correct. Like the, the cities that you named that list. That's right. Uh, recently, Intel. I don't know if you saw this, but Intel just announced they're building the largest chip factory in the world in Columbus, Ohio. That's amazing. And it's, it's fantastic. something like a twenty billion dollar over ten years project. Some right. Insane, best ever in Ohio project. So think about what that's going to do to right. Columbus with right. culture and food and jobs. music and right. art right. and jobs and right. livability. Um, so I'm bullish on cities. Oh, good. So you you see yourself continuing to be uh, this you know D.C. New York correct uh, resident? Yeah, I mean now that I'm you know I'm not retired, but I'm on my path to retirement. The big question in my mind is, where am I going to go? Well, right. I don't want to go anywhere. I'm here. This is a, a great, great place to live, particularly if you have time right. to go to the museums and, and I know you experience like the culture. I like walking in cities. Yeah, of course. That's right. Listen to podcasts. Um, how close are you, do you think, to, I mean, listening right now, you've got a pretty good life going on. How close are you to living your life to the fullest? I feel like you are close to that. But sometimes we're our own toughest critics. Like, how, how close to that do you think you are? It's a great question. I think, I'm, I think I've, I'm pretty good at doing that because I've always kind of lived in the moment and, and searched out experiences. I will tell you that, you know, as you get older and because of the virus and because you're not traveling and integrating as much as you did in the past, there's some loneliness, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to get comfortable in your own skin. You have to be comfortable that, you know, your kids are off living their lives. They're not 
you know, around you all the time. Yeah. Your friends are dispersed. Your family has passed away. It's a dis- different season of your life. It's a different season of your life. So, um, so I think you got to get out of your comfort zone a little bit and take some risks. And the virus has, you know, caused me and I, I'm sure many others to kind of hunker down mm-hmm. and not reach out and not integrate and not search out play it safe don't take the risk and, yeah, exactly so where does risk maybe exist for you i mean beyond taking on this role as chairman is i think another... the risk for me is mostly it's it's more it's more social than it is professional so cultivating new friendships cultivating new relationships mm-hmm um, you can get pretty set in your ways. You know, if you're comfortable with your partner, you're comfortable with your life, you're comfortable just hanging out with your dog, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, like, it's easier to go on that same path. Yeah, whatever. and I know, that, I know that I'm a social creature. You are. And that, you know, being a part of big organizations have allowed me to, you know, have a, you know, ready-made community at my disposal all the time. And it stretches you. And it stretches me. Um, so I think for me personally, the risk taking has to do with, you know, not getting complacent about just being set in your ways and doing what you're always doing, like right. reaching out, traveling, meeting people. You know, Path North came to me at a time when I was getting divorced and I just was on the verge of selling my company. Path North is a uh, DC-based peer group for senior leaders in business and politics and philanthropy. And what that provided me was kind of a community of new friendships that I made at a really critical time in my life. And so I have to remember to continue to search out those kind of people to get stimulated by and to yeah. and to share things with right new environments i know for me it was a stretch because you, you we listen to all these major leaders talk about take risks and don't be afraid to fail and in my you know venture capital life my day job it's it's a badge of honor if you start a company and flame out it's like oh yeah i've, I've started and failed out of uh, three companies and okay cool what's the fourth one so risk out there is definitely um not uh, frowned upon like maybe in other places but for me i was hearing all this stuff about being fearless and so i was evaluating where, well where's risk in my life and that's when i decided to start a podcast because i didn't know yeah, good for anything you. about this or a podcast or doing all this you know hardware technology and we're now in our fifth season and i feel like i'm grateful to you for like joining me on this risk coming on the program and early on you were encouraging me i remember we were talking in chamonix one time and i was just getting this started and you being a media guy a content right. guy you were you were pushing me to do it so thank you for for you know, I was at the, at the at the ledge, and you kind of give me a nice nudge off the ledge. My pleasure. Now it's the greatest podcast in the land. <laughs> Thank you. But on a serious note, you've made the show a better one by being on today. So, Peter, thank you so much for being on the Up To podcast. It's a, it's a thrill to watch your life play out in the way that it has, and I'm just grateful to, to, to be able to uh, be your friend. So right, thank Adam. you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Up To podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe via your podcast platform of choice. To receive our newsletter, suggest speakers, and give your candid feedback, please email Adam directly at adam at uptofoundation.org. We would love to hear from you. The Up To Podcast is produced by the BL Media Group right outside of the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. See you next time.